Good evening, brethren. When I was uh, looking over these notes at the very last minute, <laughs> I, uh, they told me that I was to preach on the love of God. But I, as I was looking over these notes, it occurred to me that it's not just the love of God that I'm preaching on. It's also about His grace and His mercy. They all fit hand in hand. Because of His love, we, He gives us His grace and His mercy. Amen. Continuing this topic of love, more specifically God's love toward us, if I were to ask a person off the street, uh, not necessarily a believer, to give me an example of love, they would probably give me examples from position to uh, people to just objects you can buy. Um, now comparing this kind of love to Christ's love, if I were to ask Christ this question, would he give me the same example or the same answer that the person off the street gave me. No, he wouldn't. Now, I'm not saying that God does not care for his world. For he says in Matthew 6, 26, that he even cares for the birds of the air. And how much more would he care for you? Yes. What he really cares about is you. You are his favorite creation. When he made you, he said that it was very good. But things took a different turn. We sinned. So much so that God was grieved that he had made man. We were separated from God. We could not have a relationship with Him. And that's where Jesus Christ comes in. Our Lord Jesus Christ demonstrated His amazing love toward us that while we were still living like the world in our gross, immoral, wicked sin, He died for us, as Romans 5 8 states. Someone might die for another that they loved, but Christ showed us the ultimate act of love when He died for the ungodly. And the unregenerate, the thieves, the murderers, the adulterers. He showed this love when he died for us. Amen. We were destined for hell, a place of torment, a place prepared for the devil and his angels. Mm -hmm. I'd like to read an excerpt from a book entitled, What the Bible Says About Heaven and Hell, by Fred P. Thompson. In this book, he gives an example of what hell might be like. He writes, this is a poem, O oh, endless wrath of God. How utterly thou shouldst become a terror to all men who read the frightful truths revealed to me. Enormous herds of naked souls I saw, lamenting till their eyes were burned of tears. They seemed condemned by unequal law. For some were stretched supine upon the ground, some squatted with their eyes about themselves, and others paused, without pause, roamed round and round. Most numerous were those that roamed the plain, far fewer were the souls that stretched on the sand but moved to louder cries by greater pain. And all over that sand on which they lay, or crouched, or roamed, great flakes of flame fell slowly as, fall, as snow falls on the Alps on a windless day. This is hell. Another excerpt from the book that I'm reading from. Hell is where the presence of God is not. All that God creates and blesses is missing. Nothing good or lovely or pure or true exists in hell. Mm -hmm. Contrary to all the virtues of all that is beautiful and valuable, alone remain. Indecency, brutality, corruption, and disease are the constant companions of the damned. Dying in darkness, they never die and never see the light. Hell is infinite gloom. We were to have an everlasting home here, but God in his great mercy sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sin. As 1 John 4.10 reads, now we are to have a home in heaven with him. First John 14, 2 through 4, In my father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I'm going there to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be where, with me, so that you may be where I am. You know the place where I'm going. Also in 2 Corinthians 5, 1, For we know that if our earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. This was not an easy process, that God in his great love toward us sent his son down to earth as a man. He had him go through all the same temptations and trials that we go through as Hebrews 4.15 state. But we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. Amen. Finally, God turned his face away and had Jesus Christ die a most painful death just for you. But praise God, the story did not end here, for we know that Sunday is coming. 
Jesus Christ rose from the dead, breaking the cords of sin that held us for so long. He's giving you a chance right now to come to him. For it says in 2 Corinthians 6, 1 through 2, As God's fellow workers, we urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. For he says, In the time of my favor I heard you. In the day of salvation I helped you. I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. Amen. Could you have done what Christ did? Be beaten for your enemies, ones that were against you, ones that persecuted and spit on you. Could you have gone through the pain of having a crown of twisted thorns shoved into your skull with the blood running down into your face and your eyes, and then to be severely scourged? And if that would not be enough to be nailed to a cross in such a way to cause extreme pain and eventually suffocation. Even through all this, the thing that hurt him the most was when his own fa Heavenly Father forsook him, for he could not look on sin. Christ did this for you. And praise God, he made a way to cross over that great divide that we ourselves made through our sin. Now we can have a personal relationship with him. We can confess our sin and not have to have a priest make a sin offering for us because the ultimate sacrifice was paid in full by Jesus Christ. Amen. Now he will grant us forgiveness for the asking, for he longs for men to come to him. Because of this salvation, we can anticipate his return. And his sweet and tender voice saying, as it says in Matthew 5, 25, 23, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come share in your master's happiness. But not all will experience this hope. Those that reject him will go to eternal punishment in the fires of hell. Even those that say, as it says in Matthew 7, 22, Lord, we prophesied in your name. We cast out demons and healed the sick. If they do not have faith, then they will be cast into hell by God himself. So brethren, let us strive to reach the higher calling of God so that we may arrive in victory, knowing that we will be accepted by our Heavenly Father. As you can see, this love goes far beyond a mere friendship. It's a sacrificial love between a servant and his master. It's a love in which you would have to give all that you had, take up your cross, and follow Christ. In closing, I'd like to um, read a hymn that's well known to all of you. Brother Gene Hutchcraft sang it, um, The Love of God. The love of God is greater far than tongue or pen could ever tell. It goes beyond the highest star and reaches to the lowest hell. The guilty pair bowed down with care God gave his son to win. His erring child he reconciled and pardoned from his sin. When years of time shall pass away and earthly thrones and kingdoms fall, when men who hear refuse to pray on rocks and hills and mountains call, God's love so sure shall still endure, all measureless and strong, redeeming grace to Adam's race, the saints and angels' song. Could we with ink the ocean fill, and were the skies of parchment made, were every stalk on earth a quill, and every man a scribe by trade, to write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry, nor could the scroll contain the whole, though stretched from sky to sky. O love of God, how rich and pure, how measureless and strong, it shall forever more endure, the saints and angels' song.